This is Space Time Series 19, Episode 90, for broadcast on the 16th of December 2016. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and from Space Time with Stuart Gary.com. The show is also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time The mystery of the sun's strange spin new clues about how Mars lost its water, and Virgin Galactic soars in the skies again. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have finally solved a long-standing solar mystery, namely why the Sun's outsides spin more slowly than its insides. They've found that the same solar radiation which heats the Earth is breaking the Sun, causing it to gradually slow down, starting from its surface. A report in the journal Physical Review Letters describes this photon-breaking effect responsible for slowing the Sun's outer layers. The mechanism, which is explained by Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity, should also be at work in most other stars. Our Sun rotates on its axis at an average rate of about once per month. However, unlike the Earth, whose surface all rotates at a constant rate, the Sun, being a giant ball of plasma rather than a solid object, exhibits a rotation which varies both in terms of latitude and depth. It works something like this. The equatorial region of the Sun spins at a rate of approximately one complete rotation every 25 Earth days. However, its upper latitudes near the poles are rotating far more slowly, about once every 36 Earth days. Now, scientists have known about that for a while by studying sunspots. But two decades ago, they also discovered that the outer 5% of the Sun is spinning more slowly than the rest of its interior. To solve the mystery, astronomers used several years of data from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory spacecraft and the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager instrument to measure a sharp downturn in the Sun's rotation rate in its very outer 150 kilometres. The authors found that this gentle torque is gradually slowing the Sun's rotation. It's not much on a day-to-day basis, but over its 4.6 billion year lifetime so far, it's had a very noticeable influence on the Sun's outer 35,000 kilometres. This change in rotation at the Sun's surface has important implications for how it affects the Sun's large-scale magnetic field. Scientists are now trying to understand exactly how the solar magnetism, which extends to the Sun's outer atmosphere, or corona, will be affected by this breaking phenomena. They also need to find out exactly how this will influence the local space environment around our own planet, the Earth. You see, the Earth is constantly subjected to geomagnetic activity from the Sun. These can sometimes manifest themselves in the form of geomagnetic storms or space weather, solar storms in other words. And these events can and have damaged terrestrial power grids, causing widespread blackouts, disrupted communications networks, destroyed spacecraft, and even threatened the safety of crews aboard the International Space Station. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists are now generally agreed that in the past, maybe 3 to 4 billion years ago, the red planet Mars was a warm, wet world. Since then, however, Mars has lost most of its water, transforming itself into a freeze-dried desert. Now, after investigating the upper atmosphere of the red planet for a full Martian year, NASA's MAVEN mission has determined that the escaping water doesn't always go into space gently. Sophisticated measurements made by a suite of instruments aboard the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution spacecraft MAVEN have revealed the ups and downs of hydrogen escape, and therefore water loss from the red planet. They've found that the escape rate peaks when Mars is at perihelion, the red planet's closest orbital position to the Sun, and drops off when it's at aphelion, the most distant orbital position in relation to the Sun. Even more interestingly, the rate of loss varied dramatically overall, with some 10 times more hydrogen escaping at perihelion. 
This data is providing scientists with unprecedented detail about hydrogen escape from the upper Martian atmosphere. And it's crucial for helping researchers figure out the total amount of water lost from Mars over billions of years. So, if they're looking for water loss, why are they studying hydrogen? Well, hydrogen in Mars' upper atmosphere comes from water vapour in the lower atmosphere. You see, an atmospheric water molecule can be broken apart by sunlight, releasing two hydrogen atoms from the oxygen atom to which they were previously bound. Several processes at work in the red planet's upper atmosphere could then be acting on the hydrogen, leading to its escape. Now, for a long time, scientists assumed that this loss was more or less constant, sort of like a slow leak in a tyre. However, previous observations made using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and also from Martian orbit by the European Space Agency's Mars Express found some unexpected fluctuations in this loss rate. The problem is only a handful of these measurements have been made so far and most were essentially snapshots taken months or even years apart. And that's where MAVEN comes in. It's been tracking the hydrogen escape without interruption over the course of a full Martian year, which lasts nearly two Earth years. The data shows that these large changes mean hydrogen escape from Mars is far less like a slow and steady leak and far more like an episodic flow, rising and falling with the seasons and perhaps also punctuated by strong bursts. In the most detailed observations of hydrogen loss to date, four of MAVEN's instruments detected a factor of 10 change in the rate of escape. The changes in the density of hydrogen in the upper Martian atmosphere are being inferred from the flux of hydrogen ions electrically charged hydrogen atoms measured by the solar wind ion analyzer and by the suprathermal and thermal ion composition instrument. It observed a drop in the amount of sunlight being scattered by hydrogen in the upper atmosphere. And MAVEN's magnetometer also found a decrease in the occurrence of electromagnetic waves being excited by hydrogen ions, which also indicates a decrease in the amount of hydrogen present. By investigating this hydrogen escape in multiple ways, MAVEN scientists were able to work out which factors were driving the escape. Now, researchers already knew that Mars's elliptical orbit causes the intensity of sunlight reaching the Martian surface to vary by 40% during an average Martian year. There's also a seasonal effect which controls how much water vapour is present in the lower atmosphere, as well as variations in how much water makes it into the upper atmosphere. And then there's the 11-year solar cycle and the sun's activity, which is another likely factor. Now, in addition to all this, when Mars is closest to the sun, the atmosphere becomes more turbulent, resulting in global dust storms and other activity. And these dust storms could also be allowing water in the lower atmosphere to rise to very high altitudes, providing an intermittent source of hydrogen, which can then escape. Scientists have also been measuring the ratios of hydrogen and deuterium, which is a heavy form of hydrogen whose nucleus contains a neutron in addition to the proton. By making observations for a second Martian year and during different parts of the Sun's solar cycle, the scientists will be better able to distinguish between these effects. As part of this effort, MAVEN's continuing these observations in its extended mission, which has been approved until at least September 2018. MAVEN's findings are revealing what's happening to Mars's atmosphere now. But the thing is, over time, it's this type of loss which contributed to global change from a wet, warm Mars environment of the past to the freeze-dried planet we see today. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Sydney has been selected to host the 43rd Scientific Assembly of the Committee on Space Research in 2020. The conference, which is held every two years, attracts around 3,000 space scientists and engineers from more than 50 countries. The 2020 event will build on the momentum generated by next year's International Astronautical Congress, which is being held in Adelaide, and is occurring at a time when we're seeing dynamic changes in spaceflight. The head of the Australian bid, Professor Russell Boyce from the University of New South Wales, says there's been a paradigm shift in the way people are thinking about space technologies. One exciting direction spaceflight's focusing on more and more is developing smaller unmanned spacecraft capable of acting together in swarms. These are already being used as orbital sensors around the Earth to monitor environmental and climate change, which are the greatest threats facing our planet this century. The idea of satellite swarms are also being investigated for future interplanetary and even interstellar missions. Meanwhile, at the other more expensive end of the spectrum are a new generation of secure global telecommunications networks using quantum satellite technologies. These are likely to become absolute game changers. 
Boy says as well as the ever-advancing technology of spaceflight, there are a range of other space-related issues affecting humanity which these conferences address. Things like the ever-present threat being posed to our technologically dependent society by events such as geomagnetic storms. Mitigating extreme space weather events, which are so serious that they're now on the national risk registers of the US and the UK. Yeah, we don't need another Carrington event. The, the last one um, pretty well wiped out the limited communications we had back in the 1800s. We don't want another one of those, especially now that we're so dependent on technology. Exactly. In fact, there was another one of those recently, but... Uh, it missed, missed the, the earth, earth by about yes. a what? Yeah, just. That, that is a serious thing, and major international economies are, are very worried. It's not a matter of if, but when. And so what measures should we have in place, both scientific and technical, and I guess uh, policy as well, to mitigate things when, when things go wrong? The government That's sort of activities. Yes, they do. Um, they, if they're going to make sensible decisions... They need to make it based on, I guess, technical common sense because space is an area that is so deep in the science and the technology. If you're going to do things, it has to be made on the correct basis. So, yes, they do listen. They also listen, particularly in Australia, because there's a, an increasing awareness of the dependency that we have in space in Australia and the, the growing opportunity and appetite for the growth of a space sector here. We don't even have an official space agency in Australia. That's correct. We don't have an official space agency. And I don't believe that we need one quite yet either but the day is rapidly approaching when we will so what we're seeing across the country at the moment is an increased awareness by government particularly within defense but not just defense on the need for some form of self-reliance some form of uh, domestic sovereign space capability and there is a growing strength within universities and also within industry there's more and more activity taking place for example in my own university we've literally established a space program and we have several space missions on the books and we We've been reversing the brain drain to achieve that. And so what we're finding is that government can see the opportunity for growing a space industry, the economic opportunities and the strategic opportunities, and the need to have a level of coordination and strategic prioritisation for that in the years to come. And at a certain point, the runs will be on the board when a space agency will be very relevant and needed. But not quite there yet. It's a case at the moment of needing to walk with some government need coordination before we try to run too fast, or we might just trip up and stumble. And I reckon it's not many years away and we will need an agency. I look at uh, countries like Canada, which uh, in, in terms of its GDP isn't much different to us, although they've got a really wealthy neighbour next door. They have a really advanced space program now with close cooperation with both NASA and the United States and also with the European Space Agency. They are an associate member of ESA. My understanding is that at least one of the reasons why they took up that associate membership was to position themselves as part of an ecosystem in space, given that the US was right next door, but Canada wasn't necessarily getting getting much of a look in to North American opportunities. Having said that, they are right next door to the US and there are opportunities for Canadian industry and also the research sector with their close neighbours. That's not something that Australia has. It's a long, long way from here to Europe, for example. So I know there are calls for Australia to join ESA. There is merit in that, but there's also risk. They've offered to let us join a couple of times, haven't they? Exactly. And the idea would be that we would pay a membership fee and the European system of geo return would mean that most of that membership fee, possibly all, but I'd, I'd be surprised if it was all, it's not the way it works in Europe, returns to Australia in the form of contracts in European space missions and projects. Sounds fantastic. However, there is an issue of sovereignty which needs to be considered. If the Australian government had, with limited resources, was able to pay that membership fee, which was some tens of millions of dollars per year, then we'd see that roughly that sort of money being invested into local industry in Australia, but it would be effectively dancing to the tune of European industry needs and the development of European priorities. And there's a risk there when it comes to sovereignty and, and provision of certain specific Australian-focused needs. So joining ESA could be great, but it's not necessarily the best outcome. I'm just thinking about the sort of investment that would be for our children and our children's children. Point taken, but why not invest that money in certain strategically prioritised capability growth areas in Australia, just direct investment? I believe that what we need at the moment is whole of government coordination approach where there's, it's not just a committee and it's not just policy and bureaucracy. It's fairly lean thing, similar to the way they do it in Singapore, but with enough teeth, enough investment so that projects and technologies can be invested in to fill capability gaps that we can identify that would position Australia in three years, five 
years, 10 years, to have a thriving space industry. And that, in turn, would definitely be investing in our children and grandchildren. Have you ever been to Woomera? I have, quite a few times. Uh, have you been to Lake Hart? Yes, I have. I've seen the Eldo launcher. When you see the infrastructure there, how does that make you feel? Uh, it, it, there's, there's sadness, for sure. Uh, it was amazing infrastructure in its time, and it enabled Australia to be the fourth nation in the world to launch a satellite from its own territory. And then it's all been destroyed, except for a very large block of concrete. Nevertheless, that's what happened. Many decades have passed, and we've, in some sense, come full circle to new opportunities that make very, very good sense for Australia, given the way that space technology has been transforming and the way the commercial sector and venture capital have been starting to invest worldwide and the quite staggering levels of investment and the way that the space technology with miniaturisation offers new opportunities for Australia to put disruption into space, which is something that Australia does very, very well in, in many areas. I'm thinking in particular of quantum technologies, the opportunity for quantum sensors and quantum communications capabilities in orbit based on relatively small spacecraft. There's some quite outstanding opportunities that enable Australia to play uh, niche leadership roles, to build local industry and to sell technologies overseas. Well, the Chinese Academy of Sciences and I think it's the University of Vienna have just launched a quantum satellite on a Chinese Long March rocket and that's being tested now in orbit. That's right. Yep. They're testing secure quantum communications between satellite and ground. Uh, that's one part of the story. There's a global roadmap for international secure communications that would also involve the satellite to satellite link. And that's actually something that Australia is working on at the moment. So we have a, a close cooperation with National University of Singapore and we'll be flying a mission with a pair of satellites and doing quantum key distribution between one satellite and the other. And it's a pathfinder to enable Australian quantum technologies to be deployed. To space. These will be uh, CubeSats, I take it? Very large CubeSats. Yeah. The bigger the spacecraft, the bigger the optics you can have on board and the, the more powerful the, the capability becomes. But yes, they are they are going to be large CubeSats. This is an area where we're pretty advanced in now, isn't it, developing CubeSat designs through the University of New South Wales? Yes, there's, there's actually a few groups in Australia working on CubeSat technologies at the moment. So my group is working closely with Defence and Flying CubeSats, there are other teams in the country doing so. This is Buccaneer. Buccaneer, correct. The thing with Buccaneer is that we've taken the strategy of procuring off-the-shelf spacecraft systems and putting most of the effort into the actual payload that goes into that system so that we're not wasting time and money reinventing wheels. There is an opportunity, though, to invest in the development of certain CubeSat and larger system subsystems, for example, flight computers, where one might want Australian developed technology and flight software to be, uh, I guess, in control of what's happening in a particular mission. But in general, I think if we tried to compete with a very, very large market out there internationally in CubeSat structures, CubeSat electronics, CubeSat solar panels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's something we could try to do, but it's going to be hard to compete. What do you think is the most pressing point for Australia now in terms of space technologies? One particular capability that makes enormous sense for Australia is sovereign remote sensing capability. And an example of that could be what we call hyperspectral remote sensing, which can provide a staggering amount of data to help deal with, for example, water quality monitoring, so, for example, Great Barrier Reef bleaching events, agricultural biosecurity, and also national security and defence applications. It can be an opportunity that can use existing capabilities in the country and expand on them. It can deliver science outcomes. It can deliver big data outcomes. It can help grow industry. Something, though, that needs to be developed with Australian local conditions and needs in mind. So that's one opportunity. Another one is the need to be able to do things with agility rather than taking a year, two years, five years to conceive of a, a mission or a, a need for a particular technology and develop it and eventually launch it, um, there's opportunity for Australia to be involved in the agility side of space, which can come with the transformation of technology towards miniaturised satellites. And that's something that could definitely be of advantage in this part of the world. The other way to answer the question that the pressing need is to deliver some sovereign space capability. So not simply to be relying on the sales catalogues of international companies, but to be developing subsystems, systems of spacecraft, complete space missions ourselves so that Australia is in control of at least some of its destiny with space technology. That's Professor Russell Boyce from the University of New South Wales. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time.
Virgin Galactic has returned to the skies with a series of test flights for the new spacecraft VSS Unity. Unity was unveiled back in February as part of a $400 million project. The new round of free flight testing is validating the latest scaled composite Spaceship 2 design. As part of these tests, Unity was flown to an altitude of 50,000 feet by its White Knight 2 mothership VSS Eve. It was then released to glide back to a runway landing at the Mojave Air and Spaceport. Unity was unfueled and therefore unpowered for the flight and it reached speeds of no more than Mach 0.6. However, future test flights will involve increased weights, higher speeds and a range of different flight profiles to simulate a range of different eventualities. Tests slated for later next year will also include the reintroduction of powered flights. The scaled composites Model 339 Spaceship 2 is an air-launched suborbital space plane specifically designed to carry two pilots and six passengers on space tourism flights. Spaceship 2 takes off from the ground on a conventional runway, carried between the twin hulls of its scaled composites White Knight 2 four-engine jet-powered mothership. Once White Knight 2 reaches an altitude of 50,000 feet, the space plane is released, dropping below the mothership before igniting its solid-fueled hybrid rocket engine. Spaceship 2's rocket motor burns a type of plastic as fuel called thermoplastic polyamide. The burn lasts approximately 70 seconds, enough time for the space plane to rapidly climb beyond Mach 3 on a suborbital ballistic trajectory to an altitude of over 100 kilometres or 330,000 feet, known as the Cayman Line, and regarded as the official start of space. Those on board will then experience several minutes of weightlessness and spectacular views of the planet below before dropping out of space and gliding back to Earth. This latest series of flight evaluations represents the first manned test flight of the space plane since Virgin Galactic's first spacecraft, VSS Enterprise, crashed and burned after breaking apart in mid-flight back in October 2014, killing one test pilot and injuring the other. That accident was eventually attributed to the premature feathering of the spacecraft's twin tailplanes by one of the test pilots. Sculled composites have responded to the findings by developing a modified control system designed to prevent manual feathering. Spaceship 2 uses a feathered re-entry system made possible by the low re-entry speeds used during the space plane's suborbital ballistic trajectory. The feathering causes the tail planes to pivot so as to slow the spacecraft down during its descent. This is in contrast to orbital spacecraft which are travelling faster at orbital speeds of around 25,000 km per hour. At these higher speeds they require special heat shields during atmospheric re-entry in order not to burn up. Meanwhile, as Spaceship 2 descends through the atmosphere, it eventually reconfigures its tail plane back to a gliding configuration at an altitude of about 24 kilometres, which culminates in a conventional runway landing 25 minutes after leaving space. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary.